Welcome to Technado with Don Pizet, featuring Sys Admin Expert Don Pizet, Security Specialist Daniel Lowry, and Peter. Hello and welcome to Technado with Don Pizet. I'm your host, Peter Van Rysdam, and I am joined by Don Pizet. Don, how you doing? I am doing great. A lot of exciting stuff. We got an interesting show today because I know we've had some overwhelming security episodes lately, but there's a lot of other cool stuff happening in technology I'm looking forward to talking to and looking forward to hearing from our guests. Yeah, most of the news today is about like court cases. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of like class <laughs> right. action suits and this is uh, uh Technado <laughs> SUV. Yeah, SVU. Yeah. 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 Court TV. The it's special like the, but too. way better than the OJ trial. And That's Daniel, right. how are you? I, I'm actually just kind of blown away that I just realized when you said Technado with Don Pizzette, you meant this Don Pizzette. Oh, yeah. The one Not that's the other here. One. I'm thinking the other guy. Yeah. No. Yep. Ron Pizzette. Yep. <laughs> Thought it was him. I was wrong. That's his hacker name. <laughs> and we are joined. We're, we're, you know, celebrating Linux Month here uh, this month. And so we are joined by Christopher Robinson, who is uh, a senior principal program manager for product security. Oh, wait. And, and product security <laughs> program architect? Is that what it is? Or... For pro- I don't know. Peter lacks Christopher, how are I'm you? I'm a redhead product security program architect, and I my rank is senior principal program manager. I see. So the business card has two sides. It has to just <laughs> you have to flip it over. I used to have a business card that says "does stuff." Yeah. Okay, that makes more sense. Accurate Linuxy stuff. Right? When's the last just time you, you know anyone gave out a business card? Not just COVID related, but basically you just drop it into like a fishbowl at a trade show to see if you can win a prize and that's it i keep a Those box of my days. old business cards so when i go to trade shows i can give my old email address and still get the swag oh that is ingenious i keep a box of my business cards so i can forget them when i go to conferences <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then you take mine if yeah. i recall yeah. and just write your name yeah, give like, prize yeah, to daniel not peter perfect well and you are you're better known of course uh as crobe so uh thank you for joining us so much and uh let's go ahead and, and just jump in with our first segment which is <clears throat> rapid fire questions who do you work for what's new who are you what's happening what's wrong with you all right, Krobe, this segment is our rapid fire questions. Basically, we're going to throw some questions at you and give you approximately one minute to answer. A little timer appear, appear on your screen. And if you go over, Peter will buzz you like this. There we go. And then we'll move on to the next question. So uh, each one is designed to get to know you a little bit better and learn about your experience and what you know. And the first question is coming at you from Peter. That's me. All right, so uh, the Red Hat portfolio, you guys have a lot of different products going on, um, RHEL, OpenStack, OpenShift, Satellite, things like that. So as a Red Hat program manager, are you able to, um, to manage all those things holistically, or do you address security on a, on like a product-by-product product basis? I'm going to give you my favorite security answer. It depends. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, open source is a beautiful, delicate snowflake. There's a lot of different ways it's done. So for my particular role, being the program architect, I do look at things holistically. I help implement policies and strategies to kind of address the macro problems. From the micro stuff, we have specialists that are assigned to each of the products and services that understand the particular nuances of that group. So yeah, we do both. Cool. Now, I, uh, I would assume now that Red Hat is a part of IBM, the resource pool has probably grown to some extent, and maybe that has led to some cool new innovations. Anything cool come out of that? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what's great about the acquisition is that they've really left us alone. We have access to some more resources, and really from a customer perspective, that's where you get the most benefit because now our sales teams are kind of joining forces and approaching the customer in a more holistic manner. But really, IBM is very much hands off. We kind of are, we're the stewards of our own destiny. Uh, we they don't tell us to do anything. They listen. They might make suggestions. Could you please do X or Y? Add a feature here or there. But they don't. Uh, they're, they're really hands off, which has been great. Is Watson running on on Red Hat? <laughs> that's that's his new department manager. Yeah. It's in the cloud. <laughs> <Watson. laughs> he takes his orders from Deep Blue. <laughs> All right. Well, I have been a uh, a Rel user or just Red Hat in general for a long, long time. I first used Red Hat back in 
probably 1996 or so. Uh, if we were in my office, I've got several of my old copies that are on the, the shelf there. Uh, so I, I've used it through several iterations. One of the newer features that I really enjoy is Red Hat Insights. Uh, you know, it's really mm-hmm. cool for our, our listeners out there. If you're not familiar with it, it's a web portal you can go to and you can monitor the security fixes and, and patches and things across your entire environment. That's something that for me has been really kind of a game changer, really a useful, easy way to implement security. So can you, as a as a product manager, can you give me some background on how, how like Red Hat Insights came about and, and what you view happening to it in the future? It actually has one of the coolest origin stories. Uh, I'm part of the product security group, which is part of our customer support organization, which is part of product engineering. Um, the Insights product started out years ago by our frontline support team, where they were having trouble kind of doing diagnosis of customer problems. They needed assistance. So one of our frontline folks made this tool and it was very useful. And it gradually started to expand where they made a client. They asked customers, would you be interested in installing this client so we could help do di- remote diagnosis and help provide you information. And it's really now grown to this full-blown uh, web-based platform and they keep adding you know, more and more functionality into it every quarter or so, it's great. But start off, lonely help desk person, uh, just kind of fix a problem. For me, what really made the difference is when they added the Ansible support, where not only can oh, yeah. it tell you about a problem, but you just click the button that says fix it, <laughs> and it fixes it for you. Wow, that's so easier. Just got a bunch of people fired. Huh? <laughs> well, you know, you know, Watson will run it next yeah, month. Yeah, and- yeah, right source. <laughs> Don, you got a minute 30 left. Any other questions? You know, I'm I'm curious about Crobe himself, you right? Got so, it right here. yeah, uh, obviously you you're pretty high up in the the Red Hat echelon. Is that okay? So, how did you get involved with the company? Have you been there a long time? Did you come from somewhere else? What what was your background? I'm actually a boomerang. So, uh, for many years, I was in banking and I ran the Linux Unix services for the organization. One of my employees left and went to go work at Red Hat as a technical account manager. And about a year later, he asked if I was interested in uh, going it up, and I did. And uh, I was a PAM for several years, kind of premium support for strategic customers. And then I had a mentor lure me away uh, to go be junior CISO for a while. And uh, I learned I did never want to be a CISO. It's a terrible <laughs> job. And uh, at the time, then my old PAM folks uh, routed me into the product security team here, and I got the chance to work with Mark Cox. He's a internet luminary and open source works on open SSL and Apache. So I got the opportunity to come join the product security team. So I've been here for, uh, all said and done it's almost six years, this tour and two years, the first time around. And the rest, Love as it. they say, great is place history. to be. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, thank Under you. Under time. <laughs> Well done, sir. In fact, there's enough time left for a limerick. (laughs) (laughs) Once was a man who worked at Red Hat. Uh mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll have to workshop that one. (laughs) If I had time to like work on it ahead of time. But he got mad and pulled out his ball bat. There you go. Keep going. You're 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 next. No, I I went first. You went second. Don. No, Don's next. No, I'm not the. uh, (laughs) I'm not like. uh, This was your idea. All right. Well, that was all like happy answers about cool products and, you know, how you got started. But sometimes Krobe gets mad and, yeah, and things really piss him off. So uh, <laughs> let's take a look at, at what that is in the next segment. What grinds my gears? You know what really grinds my gears? This Lindsay Lohan. You know what really grinds my gears? You, America. We now go to Peter for you know what really grinds my gears? Thank you. So what uh, what grinds your gears here, according to what I have listed, is celebrity or branded vulnerabilities and why they cause more problems than they solve. So I, take, take me back here. What is a celebrity vulnerability? So a celebrity or branded vulnerability is some nonsense made up to try to drive additional attention to a vulnerability. You can think about the classic uh, heart bleed or shell shock or the more recent sector meltdown. Those were branded flaws as opposed to following the CVE identifier, which is how all tooling and how all organizations, all vendors re- refer to an issue. I remember when Spectre and Meltdown kind of hit the, the the mainstream that they, the security researchers who had discovered it had already like uh, registered the domain name and got a logo professionally designed, <laughs> right? That little blue ghost. Yeah. And so like mm-hmm. they, they had anticipated, they thought about it from a marketing angle and put a lot of effort into it. So h- how is that? 
how was that bad though? Like, what's the negative effect of having a, a little bit of pizzazz to our security <laughs> vulnerability? Well, last year there were over 176,000 unique CVEs that were listed in NVD, the National Vulnerability Database, and out of those, Red Hat dealt with four or five named vulnerabilities. And typically the landed flaw, they're, they're trying to get attention from themselves. And it's hard being a security researcher and trying to distinguish yourself from the crowd. But when you make all this hype, you make t-shirts and beach balls and you have theme songs and stickers and whatnot, it really distracts from customers because typically these issues, while they may appear to be very important to the researcher or the media might catch on like, oh no, this is the end of the world. When you legitimately look at it, and especially compared to those 176 other thousand things, they're not that important. They do not, the likelihood that those are going to get uh, exploited is very small. And it just, it causes a lot of customer anxiety where people are fixated on this name and they're not necessarily looking at how they can manage their own risk. And if you have a good patch and vulnerability management process, where you do take vendor updates as soon as they're released, you go through some testing and you have some type of deployment schedule. Um, that's a much better way than kind of the fire drill where CNN tells you you have to go worry about this stupid ghost thing and uh, you know drop everything and have meeting. You know, we used to call it uh, management by SkyMall. For those who didn't remember SkyMall, you'd always have CIOs get on a plane and come back and say, I want this thing. Some weird nonsense they saw on the catalog. Yeah, but, a globe you know, really, that I had think, a bar inside of it, if I recall. That was, exactly. That was what I thought. <laughs> I, just, but the, I, these, I just keep thinking of the opening scene of uh, that uh, PSA, the pork chop sandwiches, right? Yeah. This, that's the, <laughs> <laughs> see, he gets it. That's funny. He knows that joke. <laughs> <laughs> pork chop sandwich. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, it just kind of reminds me of like, you know, as a serial killer, you have to you have to name yourself. You can't let the police or the newspaper oh. name you. you got to like <laughs> write something <laughs> out on the first one or like that's leave right. some specific... Uh, token behind, but so so you're saying that basically uh, these are not necessarily the, the the biggest issues, but they're the ones that get the most attention because they uh, it's called the same thing on every broadcast station as opposed to CVE one two three four, and and so that's why it gets it gets. Uh, they the have focus. some stupid catchy logo. Um, like one of them, uh, the register is pretty uh, well known in the industry for uh, having some provocative headlines. And they, they had this uh, one picture, it was like out of Psycho or something, where you had this bloody hand on a shower, uh, <laughs> nice. a glass shower. And it, it's just kind of shock and awe. And I get that the researchers need to distinguish themselves and draw attention to their interesting and creative research. But that doesn't mean that just because you found something novel, that it is going to incur any more risk or is more likely to be exploited than something else. It could be vulnerable, automated, or that you already know is uh, out in the wild using it as an attack. So what what can we do to try and help with this? Like, I, you know, obviously, if we should name, we should name all the CVs. Yeah. <laughs> so they all have. We could. That would be my, a full-time job. My friend Art Mannion actually from Cert CC has that exact suggestion as a project that yeah. they will make a stupid name for any vulnerability. Like hurricanes. <laughs> Just go down the list yeah. and we know what, what the CVs will be called. Or we could well, we could take ones that are already named and create a whole spoof campaign what around would, it. What would be awesome <laughs> if you really wanted to solve the problem? Not only would you name them all, but you would give them inappropriate names. <laughs> Therefore, no one could say them. Ah. Well, well, you've and been... That's, oh, good. So, fun fact, there was an issue where some researchers found a problem with Samba, and they thought this was the worst problem ever. And they did exactly what you described. They got a marketing team. They got a logo. They had a website. They were selling T-shirts and BS. <laughs> And they went out and it went public. And the day it happened, they're was like, oh, no, this is scary. But then as researchers, other researchers were looking at it, they found out it wasn't that bad. So they created a counter marketing campaign called <laughs> Sadlock. Oh, oh my goodness. And they were selling T-shirts and nonsense to, in, in revolt against the bad lock folks. All, all I hear is marketing is the devil. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. So, Krobe, I cut you off there. So what, what, what would, would be your solution? How would you fix this? My solution is providing calm, clear, accurate information about the vulnerability. You know, it's great to share the research openly you know, once it's publicly uh, known, and then you know, let the consumer evaluate within their own risk appetites, their own controls, and be able to react to it as part of an existing process. Don't create a, a stupid fire drill thing just because you know uh, Lou Dobbs or uh, Wolf Blitzer is telling you this is important. 
Well, you're not going to get featured on the register with that attitude. Yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> if I know anything, it's that Lou Dobbs. It's, it's all right. They're, they're nice folks. <laughs> oh, is, is Lou Dobbs still allowed on TV? I thought I he was. I don't think he is. Okay. <laughs> that's a pretty place <laughs> to mind. I thought he was removed. I'm trying to think of Anderson Cooper. The Anderson Cooper, forest. sure. Yeah. Anderson Cooper, Lou Dobbs, both. Same thing. Two gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> It's funny. I used to watch Anderson Cooper when I was in high school. He was on a uh, like a children's news network called Channel One News. Really? That we watched in the morning, and it kind of gave you some like world news. And he was like seventeen. Oh, like in your class? Yeah. Like it would be. Oh. And, yeah, and his yeah. hair was already gray. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, dang near was. <laughs> yeah. Silver fox. Gorgeous. He's right. timeless. He's, a, he's an American treasure. <laughs> yes. He is. Yeah. He's an institution. And I love their New Year's Eve, by the way. Him and Andy Cohen. They, yeah. It's a good time. Yeah good time anyway uh so if uh let's see if, if people want to find out more about what you're doing at red hat i know that uh you actually you blog a lot right i do i'm i'm part of a team that helps write blogs i write an annual risk report um i also do a lot of customer interactions very cool and uh that's over just go to redhat.com and, and there's the, the link yep. to the blog uh, blog.redhat.com you can look for christopher robinson you can see all my body of work there and then you're also involved with the Open Source Security Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you guys do there? I am. This is really exciting. Where this is a group of industry kind of uh, industry providers like Google, Microsoft, Red Hat, IBM, Intel, Cisco, where we've joined together and we've recognized that open source is critical to the world. Um, I've seen figures where open source drives between 60 and 90% of all software on the globe. So pretty important component. Well, a bunch of us resourced folks have gotten together when we've created this open source security foundation. It's a spinoff of the Linux foundation. And we're focused on a, several different areas of trying to improve the security of the software that's become critical to the global economy. Like I am in charge of two work groups, one around vulnerability disclosure, trying to share information about vulnerabilities in open source projects and libraries and components. And then I'm also helping uh, lead the group around open source uh, developer best practices, trying to teach open source developers how to write code more securely, let them aware of tools and kind of help them understand global standards. Yeah, that is definitely very cool. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, my, my last question for you, uh, and I'm, first of all, I'm jealous because I, I couldn't work at Red Hat because I can't wear red uh, with my complexion, but how many, <laughs> how many red hats, I know we got a little bit of a teaser before, but how many would you say that you own? How many? I own uh, two fedoras, this bucket hat, a fez, uh, five baseball caps, a visor, and uh, I have a beanie somewhere. Several beanies, so <laughs> I could probably own about twelve red hats. It's not bad. Don only has two. Yeah, yeah, I'm uh, I'm slacking. All right. <laughs> 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 well, Crope, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to join us and, and let us know about all the cool, cool stuff you're working on and, uh, and and the things that piss you off, too. We appreciate that. Thank you, gentlemen. I really appreciate it. This was great. Great. Well, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to have you on again in the future. But uh, stay tuned. Oh, yeah. The next yeah. time there's a high-profile security yeah. CVE yeah, yeah, with a cool name. Like, oh, what do you think about Heartbleed? Line. Hey, Heartbleed, <laughs> I should mention, I, I had uh, uh, we had a rock band or like Guitar Hero contest uh, here in the office. We put together a band, and we named our band Heartbleed and made up shirts and everything. So yeah. it works. There yeah. you go. Marketing. What were you going to say, Don? <laughs> uh, I was going to make a joke about Death Poodle, oh, the, next, uh, the next big vulnerability. <laughs> I should have let you, let you go on with <laughs> yeah, we'll save about it. that. Yeah, <laughs> we'll save, well, we can't save it now. It's out there. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Krobe, and uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. But stay tuned. Uh, we've got more Technado coming up after this quick break. I'm James Packer. I'm the general manager of Kirk ISS based in the Cayman Islands. I used IT Pro TV extensively in my last place. It grew very well. It helped upskill the team. I had 110 engineers in the field and we had dozens of IT Pro accounts with the guys training and last year alone they passed over 40 certs by using the online training. I think I can safely say um, without IT Pro TV I wouldn't be where I was today because I only got this job on the back of the qualifications I have. All right, welcome back to TechNado with Don Pizzette. Thank you so much, Christopher Robinson Krobe, for joining us from Red Hat and telling us all about the cool stuff he's working on, especially the uh, Open Source Security Foundation. Uh, that's at openssf.org. I didn't mention that before, so check that out. Hey, I also want to remind you guys, we talked uh, a little bit ago about the 200th episode of TechNado, which is happening very soon. It is happening April 22nd, and we're doing that live on YouTube. Seemed like it was yesterday, Don. No, it's in the future. Yeah. 
<laughs> this one's in the future. Oh, you mean like when we started? the beginning of oh, okay. Technado. Okay, because I've done that before where I have teased things that have you happened have. in the past. Actually, you have. So I just want to make sure <laughs> I wasn't wrong. It's a valid save. Yeah, so, if so I've got some, true. Don't forget to get out and vote. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next time or whenever, yeah. Uh, so want to let you know about a couple of things with that. First of all, we have confirmed the guest for it. I don't even know if you guys know this. The guest? Yeah. Do you know the guest? No. Is Network Chuck. No way. Oh, cool. From YouTube. I've heard of that guy. I've heard of YouTube. I don't feel I think that's not fair to just call him like a YouTuber because it's not like he makes slime (laughs) or something. He's like, you know, he actually talks about computers and stuff. He does do that. He's he's much more than a YouTuber. Yeah, he he has his own. What's it called? Do you know? I I can't remember. I don't drink coffee, so. Like Bulletproof or something? He's got, I don't know. Bulletproof is a That's a different one. Yeah, but he's got got his own coffee. And so we're going to do a lot of giveaways that day for those of you that are watching live on YouTube. Uh, and we've got these uh, the stickers here that just came in. The stickers will be uh, giveaways, and we'll have those available. We'll also have some T-shirts, uh, maybe some other prizes. Um, we'll be drinking champagne. Uh, you can feel free to... Uh, <laughs> like three hours before we start. Do that, yeah. <laughs> do that yourself as well. Champagne or maybe just whiskey. Scotch, we'll whiskey yeah. Whiskey. <laughs> Big time. Perhaps Blue Ribbon. That's on uh, April 22nd, 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. Uh, we'll have more information about that down in the description and stuff and uh, the YouTube link for that. So be sure to check that out. But we've got a lot of news to get to, as Don mentioned earlier. And so let's go and look at our first one, which is from anandtech.com. Uh, ARM announces ARM V9 architecture, SVE2 security, and the next decade. So they've announced the next decade. Basically, yes. Yeah. Which will be 2021. <laughs> Good article. <laughs> so it's uh, it's been about 10 years since ARM V8 came out. And so if wow. you buy a ARM-enabled device these days, whether it's a cell phone or a Raspberry Pi or whatever, then it likely has an ARM V8 chip in it. Although ARM V7 is still actively supported that's out there. Uh, so you'll encounter either one. Uh, but as technologies evolve, they have to move on to the next iteration. And so ARM has announced that next iteration, which is ARM V9. Um, it's been 10 years, and I, I don't want to be the, the spoil sport or negative Nancy or whatever, yeah, but you uh, do. Uh, I wasn't terribly impressed by all the new features they announced. So uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll try and sum up what we've got. There's basically a 30% performance increase, which just doesn't seem like as high as it should be for a whole architecture. Uh, there's a whole new machine learning module built into it, which I guess if you're doing machine learning, you care about. And for the rest of us, it's just wasting hardware. Uh, <laughs> there is uh, SVE2 support, which just means that if you're a developer and you compile your application, that one application doesn't have to be recompiled if it moves between systems with different size SIMD memory uh, or instruction sets. Sorry, not memory. Uh, you know, so that again, and that, that seems like a, a pretty big deal. They're good features, yeah. right? They're, they're, they're certainly an improvement. It's just not a giant generational thing. Like if I have an ARM V8 device deployed right now, I'm not going to say, boy, I really want to upgrade to RV9. It, mm. It's not that kind of thing. It, it's not like uh, VHS to DVD. It's more like... Um, DVD to HD DVD. It's like Betamax to VHS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it, it's just... For it, those of you who remember Betamax. Yeah, the old days. So. A bit of an incremental upgrade, yeah. I well, guess. You know? I, from what I understand, uh, when, when version 8 came out, they kind of rested on their laurels for like eight years. And then we're like, oh, crap, we got yeah. to do something. I guess, we'll, I guess we'll do another uh-huh. chip. What the heck? We'll throw in... I did. Uh, what, what about the enhanced vector processing? What is that? So that's that's part of what the SVE oh, yeah, side is. Yep. So okay. yeah, you know, a, a vector is like when it's doing a mathematical calculation, gotcha. and and the instructions usually only have a certain amount of size. Like the the example they gave in the article was you might have 128 bytes, hmm. right? But then you go to another system, and it might have 2,048 bytes, okay. right? So you can do longer instructions. Well, you don't want it to recompile your application and run a different size MD. So that's that's where these. Uh, the vectors come in. So, so. get into any a bit about these uh, improved security measures. That yeah, that's what I was going to ask because the, the oh. subheadline says security is to ARM v9 what 64-bit was to ARM v8. So it seems yeah. like security is kind of okay. the focus here. So they they rolled out a new thing. I'm trying to find the name real quick. Uh, confidential compute. Uh, I believe they actually call it ACC, which I guess is ARM confidential compute. I might be slightly off on the name. Oh yeah. But the idea is that an application can run. And it can tell the CPU, hey, I need you to run this in a sandbox, basically. And the CPU can wall off those instructions while they're running, and nobody is allowed to mess with it. Even even an admin or whatever, like once that program nice. is running in the CPU, it's not able to be tampered with, and then it completes, and you get reliable data out of it. Now, that feature will be supported day one. But from the people I've talked to and the, the research that I've done on it, it sounds like it's going to take a while for developers to really be able to leverage that. Because you know, getting your application to talk to the CPU is not 
something most of us deal with. So you have to wait for the kernel for your, your OS to be able to have that support, and then it'll trickle down to your application. So cool feature. I I have a suspicion, and I'll just throw this out here, and we'll see how this pans out. But uh, you know, Nvidia has been working to acquire ARM, and you know that that is not quite done yet. It's still under some mm. some review for uh, uh, monopoly review and all that good stuff. I suspect they're really holding out for ARM V10. I bet they had some big stuff that they were sitting on, and we'll see a bigger increase. And it won't be ten years before that so happens. So I was going to say, you think this is like a stopgap measure? I do. Yeah, yeah. Mm, they do that. They do like to do that. We'll see. I could be wrong because they, if you wait too long, then kind of like mark cools the market for you, right? And then, yeah. So you got to put something out. Got to be hot. Got to be still relevant. So hey, we'll add a couple of things. Got some neat stuff. A little bit of a performance increase. Hey, what the heck? But the real thing's happening in like five years when we're going to blow your minds, right? Yeah. And it'll probably be at least a year before we get any of these in our hands because we have to get kernel support for the new hardware and the operating systems have to be updated. So it'll be a while. Well, I wouldn't, would, would you say you would be surprised that if the V10 is very compatible with V9, therefore like all the stuff that they're ramping up to like be compatible that just kind of feathers right into V10. Yeah, they've been really good about that. Yeah. And I think they even called out that ARM V9 is fully compatible with ARM V8. So, yeah. you know, there's there's a lot of compatibility nice. there. Nice. Yep. All stuff. right. So we'll, uh, we'll keep an eye on that one as, like you said, it starts hitting the market and consumers start experiencing it. And we'll see how many of those claims are true. Uh, but let's move on to our next article that comes to us from the SeattleTimes.com. High Court sides with Google in copyright fight with Oracle. So if I remember correctly, because this has been going on for quite some time, obviously to make it to to the Supreme Court, you know that that's not a quick process. But uh, this this relates to uh, Oracle saying that the API that they use was basically copied by Google. Is that correct? So what happened was, I don't know if you guys probably remember uh, the flip phone days, right? The Nokia oh, yeah. days when you'd get a phone and you'd power it on and you'd see that little screen that would come up that would say powered by Java. Right. Yes. And this was back when it was un- owned by Sun Microsystems. And Sun used to say there's more computers running Sun's operating system uh, and, and Java than any other language in the world. And it was true. And it was because of cell phones and mobile devices and things of that nature. Well, when Google launched the Android platform. Now, remember, Google didn't create Android. Google acquired Android. It was a separate company. And when they did that, they said, all right, we want developers to be able to come in and write applications, but we don't want them to have to learn a whole new language because if they have to learn a new language, then it's going to make people not want to develop. It's going to slow them down. We want people to hit the ground running. Apple was already pushing big with iOS. Google wanted to get into this market. So they thought that Java would be a good choice, very popular language used by a lot of people. And so they knew that developers already knew how to write Java. But Google didn't want to pay Oracle for every single phone they sold. And so they said, all right, we're not going to implement Oracle's, or, well, Sun's at the time, Java uh, SE, the the Java runtime environment. Instead, what they wanted to do was create their own Java engine, which I I believe was called Dalvik. It it was something like that. It was a weird name. Uh, So they created their own Java engine, completely internal to Google. But then they took the API, the programming interface that Oracle wrote, and mirrored that. So developers didn't have to learn this new Delphic engine. They could write Java the way they always have. They could use the same APIs that they were already used to from Oracle, but it was now talking to Google's Dalvik uh, interpreter. Well, Oracle said, wait a minute, you can't sell all these phones and use Java and not pay us. We we need to get our beaks wet. Yeah, last time I checked, Oracle loves money. Yes, yeah, they're they're fond of it, and they got a ton of it, but it's never enough. <laughs> no, no, uh, always need just a little bit more. Well, once right? you get yeah. some, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. So, uh, so they sued, and it has gone back and forth. Google will win, then there'll be an appeal, then Oracle wins, then there'll be an appeal. So it's gone all the way up to the Supreme Court. This is a big deal. This isn't just some corporate spat or some dumb thing that none of us care about. Had Oracle won and APIs became a copyrightable, protected uh, piece of art or or whatever, then the way that we write applications would have been significantly impacted. It would be really hard for any developer to write an application that interacts with some other application without paying a licensing fee. Uh, uh, projects like open source yeah. technologies would just be dead. They would not well, be able and, to exist. And look at the difficulty they're having with things like like music copyrights, right? Like, where Google or not, oh, I guess it was Google, YouTube's giving people hard strikes because you're using, someone else has to do is coming in. Well, you had like three seconds of my song in there. 
It's like it's it's three notes. How how can you say that that's your song? You yep. don't own three notes, you know. So that it can really get mired down. And so what the Supreme Court found was that while Google did copy about fifteen thousand lines of code, seems like a lot, Don. Seems like a lot, but that amounted to zero point zero four percent of the overall Java SE code base. That and, does not seem like a lot. <laughs> and what they created with it was not a replacement of Java SE. Like it didn't do what Java SE did. It allowed right. you to interact with their Dalvik engine, a different thing. And the Dalvik in- interpreter didn't use any of the uh, of the code from Oracle. So the Supreme Court found in favor of Google and. There's no appeal to the Supreme Court. Yeah. If Oracle wants to change this, they now have to, uh, I would assume, increase the amount of bribes they already paid to the politicians <laughs> here in the U.S. to get a law passed making it that way. So that that's the only way you can a overturn. constitutional amendment. Yeah. Well, you could go to like a galactic court. Yeah. <laughs> I assume would be the next step. But, I mean, you could see how scared other tech companies were because uh, I think it w- they said Microsoft and IBM both filed briefs in favor of Google. Um, the the movie and recording industries. Um, oh, they were actually backing they, Oracle they were because of what Oracle you were saying. Side. Yeah. It's yeah, funny, so. you know, when you got two evil sides fighting it out, you're like, ah, <laughs> you know, you're yeah. like, oh, who wins this? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So there were a lot of people waiting to, to see what came out of that because, like you said, Don, the ramifications... Uh, if it had gone the other way, it would have been huge. Basically, now it just means status quo, right? Uh, yeah, 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 pretty much. And it means Oracle doesn't get money for every uh, Google phone sold. Well, that's too bad. Well, 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 actually, that wouldn't happen anyway, because I think it was three or four years ago that Google moved away from that API and just said, that's it, developers know our system enough now, yeah. and so we don't we need don't that need shortcut. Yeah. yeah, and so they cut it out. So now Oracle will make a uh, an API or steal their API. Yeah, they should and use it because they can. It's not. Yeah, I I don't know Oracle. They, they their database like they make so much yeah. money. It, it's it's incredible to get into spats like these. But I you know you stay in business by making money. I guess hey, they make Virtual Box and that's pretty nice. It's free. It is free. Yeah, yeah. you got to protect those. Trying to give something back. <laughs> Just trying to find some silver linings on these horrible people's clouds. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we can all breathe a sigh of relief yeah. because Oracle lost. <laughs> all right. Next up, this one comes from Therat.com. Microsoft kills Cortana Whoa. on mobile. And uh, yeah, it was is this that another like, court case? I, this is like a criminal <laughs> trial. No, I, yeah, I wish they, I wish they had done it like, you know, Cortana die yeah. and just, her, <laughs> arr, arr, you know, but that's not. I think it's just. Uh, it's or as if there were a kill switch inside of your your voice assistant, and or so, if it was like Space Odyssey, you know, w- will I dream? Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. You're a robot. Shut up. So here's my question: the 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 four people that had installed this on Android, does it remove from their phone, or it just doesn't work anymore? Uh, it just won't work anymore. Nate they, is going to be not. pissed. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't Nate use it? Oh, he loves it. Yeah. Really? So, yeah. I didn't, he, I didn't he met anybody. He is a Microsoft Cortana. sold out fanboy. Yeah. I, and if you had a Microsoft phone yeah. and Cortana was the default, it worked really well, right? But if you have an iPhone or if you have an Android phone, which is... But there's what, no like, Microsoft yeah. phone anymore, right? So, right. Yeah, so who's so using this? 90% of the market is using Android or iOS. Right. And that means that Cortana can't be your default voice assistant, right? So it's either going to be Siri on iOS or on Android. It's Google, so uh, whatever. Would you say it wasn't because she sucked as, a, as an assistant... It's just that she she never found a way to. She didn't have a native a platform. The, yeah, right. It, if, if you're not the default voice assistant, right. you're not going to make it. Sucks. Siri absolutely sucks. Yeah, yeah. She's and Bixby yeah. No, on the yeah. Samsung oh, device is terrible. You mean the thing I would disable if I could. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm not saying Cortana is good, but it certainly wasn't any worse than what was already yeah, out sure. there. But just if you're trying to step into this voice assistant world and you don't control the platform, not going to happen. Mm-hmm. And that's what Microsoft acknowledged, and they said that's it. How Samsung still has Bixby going is, is beyond. I have me. No idea. Does anybody use that? I, I got pissed off when they, they put that hard oh, button yes, on there that you couldn't I mean. remap. You can't do anything with it. Yeah. It's just stuck <laughs> for that. And of course, anytime you go to like pick your phone out of your pocket, it Bixby's doing all sorts of stuff. Yeah. And you're like, what the heck is wrong with this thing? Well, the other option too is you could not be poor and you could get an iPhone. Yeah. Yeah. Look down at your nose on us a little more, elitist. <laughs> so could I could I have had Cortana running on well, I guess there was no home device. There was no like Alexa. Oh, there was. They, yeah. they had a. Uh, they, they mentioned it in the article. Your laptop, if you got Windows. There was that. But there, there was a Harman Kardon speaker, the Invoke, yep. uh, mm-hmm. which is now dead. Uh, yeah. And uh, some some people, you know, the the few people who owned it, were a little upset because not only is the speaker dead, like it's dead, dead. You can't yeah. use it for anything. It you can't even anything. Bluetooth. Oh, oh you can't it. even like use the oh, speaker. Yeah. <laughs> as, as a speaker. It is a doorstop. Yeah. 
That's uh, the, you think they'll open source Cortana and just give it to the world and say, here, you do something with this one? Well, so this a is a, an important distinction. They're, yeah. playing now. they're not killing off Cortana. They're just killing off the mobile apps, oh. right? So it, it's still alive and well on your computer. Gotcha. And, and they had announced last year that they want to focus more on it being a productivity assistant. And so it will likely be taking over the voice dictation for Microsoft Office applications okay. and other places. Uh, if you have Office 365 and you use their, their uh, uh, VoIP solution... Okay. And your email gets transcribed. That's Cortana that's okay, powering that. Okay. So Cortana's not going she's, away. She's not dead, dead. She's dead she's on mobile. She's just decided that uh, I'm not going over here anymore. Yeah, well, she's had kind of, think of it as like a restraining order. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So she's she's not allowed to go no, on iOS no. and Android. Not allowed within one meter of my phone. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I, I mean, I, if, if I had a Windows machine and had Cortana on it, I mean, I've got I've got the Siri button here on the laptop. And, and I would say that... I probably use it once or twice a day, never intentionally, but uh, <laughs> I hit the button that's right next to the power button about that often. But I don't think I've ever actually used, you know, Siri or the voice commands on on a computer like this. I I'm always uh, humored uh, because she and Alexa and a couple of the other ones they they all respond to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and so you know, because them developers have told those things to shut up <laughs> quite know. a few times. They're like you know, we just need to put a function in there to make sure that she understands what I mean yep. when I say shut. up. Uh, shut your mouth and your Now, you know, me. Peter was talking about his iPhone being amazing. And, uh, you know, yeah. he, he's got a point there. You know, Mac stuff, Apple in general, always amazing, flawless. Oh, yeah, never a problem. Right, yeah. Mm-hmm. What say you, sir? Yeah, that, that button is yeah. messed up. But there's, go on and go oh, there's, the, there's more. Oh, you're going to the, the next article. Next article. <laughs> All yeah. right. Fine. Look, I, I love the iPhone. <laughs> None of these articles have anything to do with the iPhone. Uh-huh. That's just because that ain't today. Okay. Yeah. That was like the best was, transition Daniel's ever done, and uh, you blew it. <laughs> because I, I don't agree with his, yeah. you know. Uh-huh. Well, let's his, go to the article and see what they say. ThinkPad, have an ass over there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This one comes from TheVerge.com. Apple knew it was selling defective MacBook displays, no. judge concludes. A potential class action lawsuit will go forward. So this is on the MacBook Pro redesign in 2016. And apparently the monitors sucked because what the cables? Yeah. So uh, uh, in general, it's been a bad week for Apple, uh, and this was one part of it. So they they called this one Bendgate or Flexgate. I've heard both, but uh, I think Bendgate was the It'd more be popular cool one. If the uh, article was actually titled "Apple Shady Ass Practices" <laughs> gets called out by the judge. <laughs> Here but comes the judge. Basically, you know, with a laptop, you've got a clamshell design, right? Yeah. And they open and close, and so it's kind of tricky to run cables through the hinges. So they don't get pinched and break over time, especially if you open and close the laptop over and over and over again. When it comes to power cables, they're round, they're fairly thick, not that big of a deal. But when it comes to the video cable, oftentimes they're a ribbon cable. They're a flat plastic, you know, with, with various copper lines inside it's of them. It's a delicate snowflake. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it is. And yeah, copper it, can only bend so many times. Uh, yeah. And so in Apple's strive to make things as small as possible and as light as possible, that tends to make things as fragile as possible, too. But you don't notice because of the unibody design, that aluminum body they put on MacBooks, which makes them pretty pretty yeah, hardcore, pretty right? Tough, yeah. um, but this cable was not up to snuff, and so many, many people reported that that cable was breaking, or they didn't know it. What they would see is a little bit of washed-out lighting along the bottom of the monitor, and Apple would gladly repair that for you for a cost. Or if you huh. had Apple Care, they would fix it. So Apple was making money off of this. And basically what they found is that there was enough evidence to indicate that Apple probably knew about it. Now, this isn't proven. The judge didn't say this is a fact. They said it, it's very probable So uh, that Apple knew about it and continued selling defective laptops, which has opened them up to a class action lawsuit. Uh, now, quick commentary on class action lawsuits. If you're not familiar with how they work, attorneys will get millions and millions of dollars the regular consumer, five years from now, will get a $10 iTunes credit. So, well, you'll, yeah. you'll start seeing commercials soon. <laughs> Do you or someone yes. you know have a laptop with a bad screen? Did you get mesothelioma from yeah. Apple Care? <laughs> Do you suffer from moderate to severe plaque psoriasis? Yeah. yeah. Moderate to severe. <laughs> Broken screenage on your MacBook. But uh, this Dan was... got me $175,000. <laughs> I mean, this is a, also kind of a right to repair issue. 
right? I mean, I know there's been a lot of talk about well, that recently. In this case, it wasn't like you could take it apart and replace that cable yourself. It wasn't easy, but yeah. you but could do warranties it. you're avoiding warranties then. You'd avoid the warranty, yeah. yeah. And and so that yeah. does get roped into a- it. Apple said that their response to that was, you have the right to shut the hell up. Oh, okay. fair <laughs> enough. Well, uh, as you said, Don, not a great week for Apple uh, because in this article, when, when I first started reading it, I said, oh, this is probably about that, that keyboard that everyone huh. talks about, how much it sucks, the butterfly keyboard. But there was actually a link to that article with which uh, this one came out about about two weeks ago, uh, this article, Angry MacBook Owners Get Class Action Status for Butterfly Keyboard Suit. So this one is, you know, a little bit ahead of the other one. We're yeah. already at that class action status now, and uh, the suit says that Apple knew its thinner keyboard was rotten. Oh, there's Apple, rotten. Yep. For uh, for five years, wow. Apple sold MacBooks with those butterfly keyboards that totally suck. I mean, they're just bad keyboards. Everybody except for... I, don't know, I guess Johnny I have recognized that yeah. these keyboards are terrible and uh, and that the keys would jam and just be non-repairable at all. We, we uh, both had Max. Did you ever have that problem? Uh, I never had that problem, but several people here in the office did. Uh, I, yeah. did I had it. It wasn't frequent, but it happened from time to time. And you'd be like, what the hell is wrong with this thing? And you're and I would have to get the canned air out like or something, try air. to do yeah. something. Yeah. And then it would come back alive. But yeah. It, they, this it is why Justin issue. left uh, here, I think, actually. Of the <laughs> he had a MacBook. Threw his that. MacBook at Don. And that was it. So, yeah. so uh, you know, it's one of those Apple. cases where somebody at Apple decided that it looked better and didn't think about function. It was mm, form versus form function or whatever. Function, yes. uh, and they were able to find documents where some executives inside of Apple had made comments about the quality of that keyboard, and yet Apple continued to sell it. So the judges have authorized that for a class action lawsuit as well. Uh, for most corporate entities, a class action lawsuit is really dangerous. Right. They can lose a lot of money in the case of Apple, though, where they have literally (laughs) billions of dollars in cash in their bank account. This is not like in stocks and bonds and and whatever. Like this is liquid money. They have like how much do you want? Billions (laughs) upon. And, you know, I I say billions. I'm pretty sure they have over a hundred billion dollars. Because aren't they near a trillion cash? (laughs) They're near a trillion valuation. Yeah. Yeah. As a company. Yeah. Yeah. And a good bit of it is in Ireland or whatever, in this mystery account. (laughs) In the Scrooge McDuck uh, warehouse. Yeah. So I don't think they're sweating this, but for the attorneys, they'll make millions and the rest of us will get our $10 iTunes gift card. And by the way, I wasn't saying Scrooge McDuck because you said Ireland. I realized that he is from Scotland. <laughs> he good, is a Scottish good point. duck. Very good. Uh, McDuck. Very good. Mac uh, duck. Also fictitious. What's that? No, it's true. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, I think it is. it Mac duck or McDuck? Well, it, would be, it was McDuck. I thought it was McDuck. But, but he seemed I Scottish. It was McDuck. He is Scottish, but now i got to look at yeah, it. Is Mick not no. Scottish? I thought, well, I thought Mick so was, was Irish is, and Mac learned something new. Mostly it is Irish. Oh. Right. You, it's you like do I'm, see it in Scotland. I'm though. Van Rysdam. That's Dutch. Von Rysdam would be German. Oh, that's right. Okay. The language is very similar. My neighbors are from South Africa, and they speak Afrikaans. Oh, wow. And it's like this amalgamization of... Do you see Blood Diamond? Like crazy, yeah. You, like when really he's speaking cool. Afrikaans to people, you're like, that. I can recognize some of that. Yeah, like, like, I get that, but oh, I my, don't. My four-month-old son loves it. They just sit there and talk to him oh, in sure. Afrikaans, and he's just like... Yeah. <laughs> I like this. I'm like, yeah, me too. Get out of the way. Speak some more of that. <laughs> He's gonna do well in school. <laughs> you gotta do well. In school. All right, all right. Let's uh, let's move on before we start some sort of culture war. Because all I know is people in Ireland get get pretty pissed and they know how to work bombs. Just uh, just sure. ask Dave Mustaine about that. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Send him a DM right now. Yeah. Hey, Dave. <laughs> Tell me your story about being... Oh, man, that was bad. All right. This next article comes to us from bleepingcomputer.com. Microsoft outage caused by overloaded Azure DNS servers. And I remember actually coming across this last week. Some people uh, yeah. having issues with... What was it this time? It, wasn't 365? Was it 365? No, that was a part of it. It was actually the bulk of Microsoft services: Xbox Live, Microsoft Office, SharePoint Online, uh, Intune, Dynamics 365. The list goes on and on. Basically, so everything. Microsoft. So what wasn't? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, it's kind of embarrassing for Microsoft because just back in March last month, they had a 14-hour outage when a uh, a little code change went in incorrectly inside of Azure Active Directory and everything tied to Azure AD broke, which is the bulk of Microsoft stuff. Well, this time the problem was in Azure DNS. And it turns out that not the bulk of Microsoft's products, 
all of Microsoft products yeah. rely on Azure DNS in one form or another. Uh, you know, they have a very uh, extensive DNS infrastructure in place. In fact, they call it, I forget their actual name, like resilient DNS or reliable DNS. Like it's in the name Oops. of the DNS product. Uh, so it has edge servers that have caches on them. There's the core servers, there's super amounts of redundancy. But basically, they were being hit by an, a, a type of attack where there were a lot of DNS retries coming in. And due to a, a bad code change somebody had put in, DNS retries weren't being filtered for volumetric attacks. And so all of these retries were passing the cache and going into their actual core DNS servers and overwhelming them. And so that DNS, I mean, it... It, it really shut them down. Even their status page went down, which is, we've made fun of that a few times. Like that's, yeah, that's they were like really... pointing people to a secondary page on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's embarrassing when your status page goes down. That means you've really got you're, you're problems. Yeah. Shouldn't your status page be like on AWS? Well, if you're Amazon or so if, you're, if you're Azure. For any normal company, your status page should be on a separate provider, yeah. right? But for Azure, or for Microsoft, for Google, for Amazon, AWS, like they, they find it as a point of pride. We host our own it status looks page. Bad. But then when it goes down, this looks it worse. looks real bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <It> looks <laughs> which happened to Amazon last year. So uh, all these cloud providers, they do have outages. They're not invulnerable. It would be funny if they were kind of like a, um, almost like a little fraternity of, of cloud providers and they kind of... Uh, nicely ribbed each other about this. You know, that wouldn't happen if you had it on AWS. You know, that kind of stuff. It'd be fun. Yeah. Now, but they can't. They gotta they gotta hate each other. You do hear people who will say stuff though like, Yep, that's why I don't put my stuff in the cloud. Yeah. But then you look at their implementation, like, oh, you didn't have any outages last year? Yeah, yeah that's why you I store my yeah. data under yeah. my mattress. You didn't have a hard drive fail or Yeah. Yeah. Some yep. person brought in some malware. Well the good so, news uh -huh. is here uh, that Cortana was not affected, or at least <laughs> no one pushed the button. That's right. During this window, so they're not <laughs> exactly noticed. sure, but uh, yeah, Cortana. On, Cortana died. On, on mobile was fun. <laughs> That's what happened. Somebody said Cortana died, and Azure DNS just dropped Girl. on the floor. They're like, oh no, we hooked it into Cortana. Cortana periodically going, is it? Anybody need anything? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> no, we're good. There's okay. nobody out there. <laughs> Where is everyone? <laughs> Cortana's like, I'm, I'm going to the bar. It's my treat. Anybody yeah, yeah. can get it? I'm paying. Please. Yeah. Something. Come on. Is that like Clippy's, Clippy's daughter? Is that Cortana? <laughs> Bob and Clippy yeah. had a uh, had a daughter yeah. in Cortana. I just want to see Clippy with like, you know, male pattern baldness. And I'm like, oh, there's my little <laughs> <Yeah>. girl. <laughs> Making dad jokes. Yeah. All right. Uh, anything else to cover on that one? Are we, are uh, we I think we've beaten that ground? one to the ground. I think we've right. beaten it <laughs> sufficiently. Well, our next article is actually uh, from a segment that we haven't done in a while. We used to do this one all the time. Um, maybe things have, have gotten better in the world, and, or maybe we've just uh, forgotten this segment exists. But this one is Who Got Pwned? Looks like you're about to get pwned. Fatality. Yeah! All right, this comes to us from KrebsOnSecurity.com, and this one is uh, called Whistleblower. Ubiquity breach is catastrophic, in quotes. Catastrophic. So, uh, Don, you said there's uh, sure. a little bit of... of um, Concerned so, about, about how accurate this is? Or? Yeah, so th this is an interesting one. Um, you know, this could have been a Deja News segment. Because back in January 11th, Ubiquity Networks had a breach. Now, we didn't report on that one. And the reason was when Ubiquity put out their information about the breach, it appeared to be a very, very small thing that hackers had managed to compromise the credentials of a user account and gain access to the network temporarily. But they didn't really get access to much. I think they said 230 email addresses or something in the original release. It really wasn't a big deal. Companies are getting breached left and right. We probably had eight other breaches to report on that week, and so we didn't we didn't cover it, right? Well, that was back in January. Well, just the other day, Brian Krebs received a anonymous not not anonymous. He actually told him who it. it we don't know who yeah, it is, right? right? But uh, but he, he received a, he, a yeah. He's protecting the name of the innocent here, right? Yep. So he got a whistleblower report from somebody saying, look, this breach was way worse than what was announced. Now, personally, I don't like reporting on things where there's only one source and we don't know who they are. And there's no way to verify, but Ubiquity Networks has come out themselves and made a few statements that make this all sound pretty true at this point. So it looks like hackers did compromise the credentials of one of the administrators of Ubiquity Networks, but that credential then gave them access to the entire AWS environment that powers all of Ubiquity networks, which means they had access to 
all of the databases, all of the customer data, all of the private keys, and the ability to reach out into all of their cloud managed systems. If you used a Unikey or any of the Unify stuff, uh, all of that was basically fully compromised back in January. And while they spent several days dealing with their own infrastructure, trying to, trying to shore it up, they didn't notify customers for a little while. So some time went by before they notified people that, hey, this incident occurred and you might, you know, you need to change some passwords or whatever. Well, if you are a ubiquity customer, I'm not saying throw your equipment in the trash because, again, we, we don't necessarily know how true or, or false this article is based on one anonymous whistleblower. Kill it with fire, done. <laughs> However, it doesn't hurt to change some passwords, right? Do some software updates. So what I am saying is if you use ubiquity equipment, um, hit pause and go change your user credentials. Go do your firmware updates and just assume that somebody else may have gained access into your network. Wow. Oh. This is uh, when it said ca catastrophic, I thought, hmm, is that an oversell on this? But if everything that this person, this whistleblower has said is true, that's pretty bad. That's that's a bad yeah. breach. Do we have an access point in here? Don't we have ubiquity? <laughs> no, nah, we pulled all that equipment out last oh, year. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking around like, I remember like that. We used to. Yeah. On this. Remember yep. we hacked in. I mean, uh, somebody right. hacked in. <laughs> we had actually pulled it out not long before the breach happened. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. Um, but, you know, according to the whistleblower, one of the, the uh, ubiquity statements, they said, uh, we have done an analysis and we do not see any evidence that the attackers accessed customer networks. And what the whistleblower is saying is, look, Ubiquity security was so poor, they didn't even have logging turned on for API access. So they wouldn't know. So mm -hmm. they have no way of telling. So when they make a statement, we couldn't find any evidence, that's a true statement yeah. because they didn't do any logging. We have no reports it, of... So my question yeah. is, is, do they do business in the EU? Yeah. Yeah. That's all right. So GDPR yeah. is going to kick They're in. They're a the U.S. company... It, but aren't they going to be UK, fine? Right? Like, well, so it, it depends, yeah. and and this this could erupt into something bigger. But did customer data get out? Right. right now, according to the GDPR, if you have if you detect a breach that indicates customer yeah. data may have gotten out, hours or whatever, I think it's three days, yeah. right? Seventy two hours. Yeah. Uh, so you get three days. But if they're saying no, we didn't we didn't detect that. We don't see any evidence of it. Uh, ha, ha, ha. That could be their uh, loophole, shifty. right? He's some shifty sucker. Yeah, yeah, it's not a good uh, way that's to do the smart business. Thing, turn reporting off. Yeah. <laughs> was anything I breached? Detect, Jack. I have no Crap. reports of breaches. <laughs> yeah. But I, I will say, you All know good. that. Ubiquity serves a particular market. They make low-cost networking gear that's fairly reliable. So if you're a small or medium business, their equipment's really attractive. Whether this is true or false, doesn't matter. It doesn't cost you any money to go and change some passwords you know, and update your equipment. Crime bosses provide an excellent service of protection. <laughs> yeah, I'd hate I to mean, see something amazing. happen to your network. Yeah. Such a beautiful network here. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be a shame, yeah. really. So why, why, why do we pull ours out here? Did, were, or like Performance some issues. Nostradamus thing going? Yeah, it was. <laughs> Nostradamus. It, there were enough people that were getting like drop connections and handoff oh, yeah, wasn't it was working, and and it, there's that the Tim has a saying for this. I can't remember. It's like if the the frustration of staying is the same cost as the frustration of change or whatever, oh, then yeah. you go do it. So we were at that point where yeah. it was just so annoying that we switched to Meraki. There we go. All yeah. right. Well, Which I'm is cloud managed. So when Google has their, I mean, uh, Cisco has their breach, then oh, we can we can deal with that. Totally. Host. <laughs> well, this one is early in the news cycle. Then, if it's uh, kind of just coming out, so maybe we'll see this, uh, you know, yeah, snowball a little bit and gain some steam as uh, maybe more people come out as a result. So uh, maybe more people will be switching from Ubiquity as well. We'll find out. To Daniel's point, this will likely lead to a bigger investigation happening, yeah. and then that's when we'll find out the facts and and what what actually went down. All right, cool. Well, we have a couple of uh, fun webinars coming up. There's actually one today on Thursday, April 8th uh, at 2 p.m. Eastern Time with Don. What Linux distro is right for you? We'll be looking at uh, Linux in the workplace versus Linux at home and see what systems are best. We also got another one coming up on Thursday, April 29th. That is Going Cloud Native with Linux. Move your Linux workload to the cloud. And that's with Tamika Reed, uh, who I know is, uh, started out like a Women in Linux Foundation and, and things like that. So uh, she is uh, a great source on that topic. That's Thursday, April 29th, also at 2 p.m. You can register for either of those at itpro.tv slash webinar. You can also see all the archives of the other great ones from the past, like the one Daniel just did on uh, Top 5 CTFs uh, with John Hammond and, and all the other great ones we have at itpro.tv slash webinars. And while you're on that internet, head over to go.itpro.tv slash technado. 
while you can because the new Technado website is coming very soon. We'll be ready for our Ooh. 200th episode launch. Yeah, get ready for that. Um, but in the meantime, go.itpro.tv slash Technado, and you can get a 20% off coupon code for the lifetime of your personal membership. And you can also request a team trial and find out all the cool features available to teams like the Pro Portal available at ITPro TV. That's go.itpro.tv slash Tech NATO. All right. Well, thank you to Crobe. Oh, yeah. Go Just ahead. Just as a, a side note, I, I've actually been getting some emails from people about uh, whether or not they can still do our SHART certification. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you um that, that you know that that'll stay up. It, it yep. Our, our shark came out on April 1st. <laughs> but uh but it's know, sticking around. It, yeah, it's, it's uh yeah, it's not, not going just anywhere. Just the memories, but uh yeah, so there's So ask Barry about his Walmart experiences. That junk had me in stitches. All right. I have no idea what is happening so, here. We're, we're talking <laughs> about sharks. Right. So okay. they, there was a and security Barry. breach when he was at Walmart. Yeah, that's it. Okay. <laughs> there was a breach <laughs> or something. But uh, yeah, you can still go uh, to itpro.tv slash shart and uh, you can download the sign that says, um, you know, a shart free workplace. It's been this long since uh, security hack acknowledge respond train, train. Yep. Yes. Uh, is what, of course, shart stands for. Uh, as we Everybody all know, knows that. Yeah. yeah, duh. But uh, yeah, I've got to I've got to print that out and put it next to my uh, on my my desk. I've got my crap certification yep. for certified reboot uh, associate professional, uh, and the uh, <laughs> certificate for watching the IT fundamentals course on Expert TV. <laughs> uh, so, so that one's real. And uh, what was the other one? Oh, I'm I'm a certified uh, pen, pen tester, tester from yeah. Daniel's. Uh, for example, I know that up. this one is a pencil, um, not on, a pen. Yeah, it's a mechanical pencil. Test. Yeah. So, it did. Yeah, failed, yeah. Now failed the pen findings test. on that. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but yeah, head over to itpro.tv slash chart uh, and still print out that sign. We're, we're not taking that down because it's too fun. Yep. But yeah, thanks, guys. And uh, thank you, Krobe, uh, for joining us. And uh, we'll have some more Linux stuff the rest of this month and uh, have some fun. Uh, join us on the 22nd, like we said, for that YouTube Live event for the 200th episode. Uh, but we'll see you next week right here on Technado with Don Pizzette.